thank you so much. Good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers. Initially, I had expected to be to come to Luxembourg about two years ago or so. And now I'm in Dubai. Okay, things happen. Uh, and in these two years of the pandemic, two things. I, I never visited an international conference in person. It's my first one since two years, so I'm a little bit excited, but also nervous. Uh, and the second is my capability of English language, which, which was always more or less poor, it disappeared um, over these two years because of lack of opportunity. So I hope I will manage to, uh, to come through the presentation without um, larger accidents. Um, what, what, what kind of, of a presentation of keynote can you expect? Uh, I'm, I'm not a researcher. In, on, on digitalization, on artificial intelligence, on philosophy of mind. Um, I'm a theoretical person, but also a practitioner in technology assessment, and that means I'm a lay person in almost all of the disciplines. Um, I was thrown into the field of digitalization and uh, AI, um, not by scientific curiosity, but by the mass media in Germany. There were some huge interviews, one pager in German newspapers such as Süddeutsche uh, two or three years ago. I don't know why they uh, approached me, but they did, and these interviews, they, um, they got some dissemination, and then I had the, got the opportunity to write a popular book on digitalization, and so things went on. And then I was um, appointed member of some commissions, recently to the German Ethics Council, where we are now thinking about AI uh, foundations, but also about applications on medicine, education, and democracy. So that means I'm not an expert in the deep understanding of what AI is. I don't know whether, there, whether somebody, anybody knows about this, but I, I'm sure that I do not know. Um, my field is more the debate over, over AI, the public perception, the narratives which um, are debated and contested and so on. And in a sense, in my field, we, we uh, demarcate this type of debate as uh, hope, hype, and fear technology. So it's all of them. And I would like to go a bit deeper into the perception of uh, AI in these debates with the philosophical, uh, um, with philosophical glasses, of course, uh, and then come to some, um, yeah, not results. So what I will do is more to, to look for the good questions than to give answers. And the story behind is that in these interviews and in the ethics committee and so on, there's always the question for ethics. What should we do? What should we do about regulation, about promotion, and so on? Um, but my suspicion is that there is something behind which we should talk about. And I'm looking for this dimension behind, and I assume this has something to do with philosophical anthropology. However, I'm not an anthropologist. So be careful in listening and be critical. OK, I would like to spend the coming 30 or 40 minutes with this storyline. And I will start with the perceptions and then go to the questions I have. And perhaps, I, I hope, of course, to get feedback. It is a kind of experiment. Um, in these two years, I developed some, some, some ideas. Um, I, I did a, a German um, edited volume with the title, Wer bist du, Mensch? Uh, the transformations of human self-understanding. Uh, self in dialogue with the technical, uh, technical advance, scientific technological advance. And uh, so um, I had little occasion, little opportunities to really get feedback in a forum like this one. And so I'm curious to learn from you. Okay, my point of departure, as I said, is 
narratives on AI between paradise and apocalypse. I guess you know all of them, so I will not go into the details. Please take a short look on, on the catchwords. So, of course, the prediction issue is uh, very present in some communities, um, predictive policing, medical diagnostics, but also I read, recently I read the idea that uh, with AI you could uh, predict uh, the winner in a war. Well, that's ambitious, I guess. It, t it tells something about the mindsets of those people who, are, who tell these stories. Um, perspectives for the labor market, hope, hype, and fear, of course. Um, robots as colleagues, this will be a major issue during my presentation. The artificial companion storyline, kind of new butlers. If, this, if it is allowed to take this world from an old civilization, old, good old British one. Uh, connecting human brains with computers, uh, these cyborg stories, and uh, at the very end, also overcoming the necessity of aging and death with a perspective on immortality of at least the human consciousness. Okay, this is the um, hope, the paradise expecting side of the storylines. And the other is, of course, fears of loss of control. That is quite clear. Power of algorithms, perhaps algorithms get uh, self-conscious, uh, uh, develop an own intention to, to rule, and then they could take over control. All these stories we, we know very well from the science fiction domain. Um, Henry Kissinger, I guess some of you will still know this name. He, I guess he's still alive. Um, um, he wrote, human society is unprepared for the rise of artificial intelligence. Now you might say, well, Henry Kissinger, he's not only a white old man, he's a very old white man. Uh, but uh, this paper, if you would like to look into it, it was in the New Atlantis, it's really a good paper. Um, and there are many warnings against uh, possible uh, uncontrollable side effects of the emergence of uh, AI systems. Uh, some people are in favor of this, like uh, Ray Kurzweil or Nick Bostrom. Oh, Nick Bostrom not, in the, not only positive, but there are great storylines behind this great singularity thesis and the super intelligence storyline. Okay, this is about narratives which um, have, a, I guess, a considerable influence on public debate and also on the mindsets of policymakers. Policymakers, they give support because of more or less economic reasoning. Um, two or three years ago, our previous Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel um, announced a German AI strategy with two billion euros of additional funding for this field. But how did she deal with this issue of uh, problematic issues, uncontrollability, discrimination, and so on? Well, it's about ethics. Of course, in that program, ethics had a prominent role. This is quite self-evident uh, in contemporary time, different from 20 years ago. Um, it's always, always ethics is, all, is already included. Well, there are many ethics commissions on AI. Uh, there are guidelines available already, uh, for example, from the European Union. Um, my thesis is that Ethics is necessary, of course, for doing the next steps, for perhaps regulating um, the systems, for taking care of ADM uh, systems, automated decision making, about discrimination, uh, and so on. Of course, this is necessary, but I guess it's only part of the ga ga game. Uh, my assumption is that beyond these ethical questions of what should be done, in the next steps are questions with regard to what we humans are in the mirror of artificial intelligence, uh, which um, becomes more and more powerful. So this is the story of human inferiority compared to AI systems, human finiteness, the future of humankind, 
salvation by AI, for example, is also an issue. So big stories behind, which are not ethical in, a, in the philosophical sense, but a bit different. Well, we will see. And in order to prepare um, the, the questions uh, arising from, from these dimension behind ethics, I would like to spend a few minutes on, on, on history of technology and also of philosophy of technology. Um, traditionally, we see technologies as means to an end. So this is a good old instrumental rationality. We humans are the, the subjects and we determine the, the ends and the engineers make the means in order that we can reach the ends. So, so simple storyline. Uh, this storyline includes the assumption that this constellation, we the subjects, technology, the object, will not alter ourselves, not alter ourselves. We remain the same humans we are. We are enabled by technology to do something which we could not do without that technology. Um, first, relative, uh, first relativization of this approach uh, came from John Dewey and, and others. Uh, they uh, observed that there is an overflow of consequences because as soon as the technology is there, uh, it is part of the world. And so it may serve to the end it was designed to, but it also may serve to other ends and purposes. And so there is something beyond the initial, initial, initially planned ends and purposes. So there are unforeseen consequences. Sometimes there are positive, but mostly uh, unwanted. For example, climate change is a typical unwanted consequence of of the use of fossil energy carriers and, and other origins. Um, as soon as the technology is there, humans adapt. Think, for example, I guess Dubai is a, might, might be a good example. As soon as there is some infrastructure, as soon as there is a new uh, park of skyscrapers, then people will adapt. They will go for working there. They will use the metro, for example, if there is one. And if there is a bus line, they will think about using the bus or not. So as soon as the technology and its services are there, we humans adapt ourselves. And I guess infrastructures is the best example. The energy <coughs> infrastructure, the mobility infrastructure, the communication infrastructure. Um, now. I guess hundreds of millions or perhaps billions of people worldwide organize themselves according to the opportunities and rules given by uh, Facebook, Instagram, and, and others. So we adapt to those systems. And this what is what I like to call the two, two future dimensions of technology. There is an ex ante perspective, a perspective of projection, planning, designing, uh, having some ends in mind for, to, to which the technology shall be developed. But as soon as the development has happened and the technology is there, then in the exposed perspective, uh, there, the, the world looks different. And then humans adapt to this changed world. Um, this situation is, in principle, well known, I guess, to all of you and to, uh, to, to many others. Um, it is familiar in technology assessment, for example. Uh, it's part of consequentialist reasoning. For example, we in technology assessment, we try to get ideas about possible unintended consequences in, in advance to bringing technology to, to society. So in order to be prepared for possible risks or uh, chances, opportunities, whatever. This is consequentialist reasoning. But I would like to go one step further and, um, and look at our perception of the world. And I guess that technology can change our perception. Um, for example, take uh, Martin Heidegger. Uh, while having a hammer in hands, the entire world looks like a nail. As soon as we have some technology, we have a different approach to the world uh, surrounding us. For a car driver, the world looks different compared to pedestrians or bikers. 
They even, they, for example, use different kinds of maps or different kinds of route planners. So this is a different view on the world. Um, these observations con concern our perception of the external world. Um, but I guess AI and even other technologies, but now it's the focus on AI, AI may change the human self-perception. Um, and uh, this is one reason, I guess, is this notion of intelligence. It's uh, crucial from the very beginning on, uh, since the 1950s, this, to have this notion in, the, in this phrase of AI. If um, the fathers of AI, of the notion of AI, would have used another phrase, perhaps the whole story would have developed in, another, in a different manner. Um, because intelligence, um, yeah, we humans are used to see intelligence as, as part of ourselves. Um, we know that we are not the only ones, the only species in the world, but uh, we believe, according to tradition and history, that we humans have a kind of special intelligence. And um, now the idea of having an artificial intelligence changes, hmm, changes, changes in order to, to risk a very big word, changes the ontological situation of humans and accordingly our self-perception because now there is one uh, a new species, a new intelligent species in the world which we ourselves have created but we see it grows and grows and we don't know uh, where the end uh, of this growth uh, will be. What we can see that this new type of intelligence is better than ourselves. Um, in many, many respects, we know, um, um, also the good old computer was better and still is better than we humans are in many respects for calculating uh, purposes, for example. But now with this additional word of intelligence, it sounds different. Um, so the um, the um, big blue issue, 1995, the uh, the Czech uh, um, um, story with Boris Kasparov. It was good old digital technology. Well, uh, we have accepted that, but now uh, with this notion of intelligence, learning in the in this world of of AI it sounds different and it raises different questions with respect to, to our self-understanding uh, because if we are intelligent and AI is intelligent and is, is better in many respects. What does this mean? Okay, um, I, I integrated this slide uh, last, uh, last night only <laughs> after having uh, after having performed the taxi driving through Dubai, my spontaneous um, impression was, well, um, looking to the skyscrapers, the, the, the roads and so on, the bridges, it looks like Metropolis, if you know, if you know the movie, okay. And it's all, it already included this idea of having a machine uh, human, kind of artificial human. In, 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 uh, so designed by, by, an, um, by an engineer. Now coming to this issue of human self-understanding. Okay, what we can see in history is um, human self-understanding or models of humans have been developing parallel to scientific and technological uh, issues. For example, this um, Lom machine uh, from 18th century, La Métrie, it was a mechanical machine. And of course, it, was, it, it matched the era of Isaac Newton with a fascination on mechanics, on clocks. Um, and so it was plausible to regard humans also as a kind of mechanical machine. Um, in the early industrialization, 
uh, Karl Marx uh, saw humans as homo laborans, the working, uh, the working um, persons. Um, because work became an issue in that time, working in this industrial sense. The homo faba, uh, with, in this um, story by Max Frisch, uh, it was a baby of the, of the incredible optimism in progress in the 1950s and 60s. So it, fit, it fits well to that feeling, to the zeitgeist of that time. And now, of course, what's the zeitgeist of today? Uh, we are going digital all the time, and so it's quite natural to regard humans as a kind of homines digitalis, as um, computers, as computers with a body on two legs, but in the last consequence, as computers. And if we are computers, if we were computers, sorry for this, if we were computers, and uh, then we have these AI computers on, on the other side, and the AI computers are better than ourselves, then we have a problem. Or some people think that we have a problem. Perhaps we don't have a problem, but it's good to ask whether we really have a problem, and in case that yes, what this problem might be. Um, that technology is better than humans, this is tribal even a very simple technology like an instrument, a hammer or whatever, is better than uh, if I want, yeah, if I want to, to, uh, to hit a nail into a wall and I use my, my hand, uh, it will not work very well. But it's much better with a hammer. But the hammer is not a problem to our self-understanding. Yeah? Now why is, the, uh, why is artificial intelligence, why might it be a problem to our self-understanding? It must have to do something with this issue of intelligence. Learning, because I guess AI is the first technology in human history which is able to develop further on its own. Um, usually technology, hmm, it gets, um, it corrodes and after some years it does not no longer work, there is some uh, dysfunction and so on, and then we will throw it away and buy a new one. Um, this is not a good process. It's the process of decay. That is quite normal. But in this case, AI algorithms can develop further, can, um, can um, perhaps even um, explore new capabilities. Um, I'm not an expert on this, I report on the storylines which are perceived in society. Um, the notion of intelligence, I already repeated this several times, and uh, the combination of intelligence and learning um, leads to this issue of autonomous technologies, and this is also a problem, might be a problem for human self-understanding, in particular if you look to the anthropology of Immanuel Kant, who saw as humans, as the beings on the planet Earth um, who, which are designed to be autonomous, to, to define, to determine the rules to whom they would like to follow, not to accept um, rules given by others. This means autonomous. And now we call robots autonomous we call, we call social bots autonom uh, autonomous and so on. So this is again a challenge. Um, now we, when we see to some, we look to some examples of autonomous robots. The assistance issue is rather simple. Um, this one has been designed at KIT. Um, very sensible with its hands but I guess it's really an assistant and not more. Uh, the companion, the pepper, uh, it's a bit more because um, it can communicate in a more or less sophisticated manner uh, and uh, it shows some similarities to human behavior. 
it's more than just an assistant. It's a kind of companion. And in the advertisements, we read that Pepper will entertain you, will, um, will be a, an assistant to lonely people, will communicate, uh, will take away this feeling of being lonely, and so on. And in the era just to be designed, in the industri industry 4.0 world, uh, people talk about humans and robots cooperating at the workplace, and there's even this, um, uh, this word of cobots already at place. And that's a very interesting phrase. Uh, in all these um, presentations on Industry 4.0, and almost all of them, uh, I found this word, this cooperation between humans and robots shall take place on equal footing. And this is a very interesting notion. What does this notion mean on equal footing? I will come back to this in a couple of minutes. Um, this companion issue is interesting because uh, the advertisement often is in a, in a way that we, we, can, we, can, we, can, um, we can assume that there is a negative image of humans behind. The advertisement is uh, these uh, companions are always friendly. They are always at the, at the service of, of customers uh, and humans. They uh, never get tired. They always be, will be in a good mood. They have a smile and so on. And we know that humans um, not always have a smile. Yeah? <laughs> so there is kind of as, as a language behind um, which, which tells us humans that we are deficient in a, in a specific manner because we sometimes get tired. We sometimes are in a bad mood. Uh, we sometimes are, um, have problems at home uh, which we take uh, to the workplace and so on. So Pepper as the better human companion with a question mark. Care robots as better nurses. Um, there are stories behind, uh, and they operate with the same uh, with the same idea that these robots they will not have uh, the, these negative uh, properties humans necessarily have sometimes. Um, okay, they never get tired. They always have good mood. They are always at disposal, and so on and so on. You can expand this idea, and we find a storylines of this uh, for, um, mostly in the United States uh, of America uh, to other professions. A teacher, for example. Teachers have biases that is well known. They, they uh, have a prefer preferences. They like some students more than others. They are not always just. They do, they do not have all the knowledge they, they should have, and so on. Couldn't be an AI teacher much better than a human teacher? A judge. Judges as human persons are also sometimes biased. They are tired or sometimes aggressive and they have good days and bad days and so on. An AI judge would be just, they, some people say, objective, rational. An AI judge could within parts of seconds uh, make use of all the material on f similar cases worldwide. Um, so why shouldn't we go for AI judges? Uh, the political system, democracy is a very complicated system. It is often slow and it, takes, it needs a lot of effort. Um, the AI would be very fast. Uh, yeah, and what, what do we know about politicians? What is our image of politicians in the United States? Uh, in the Silicon Valley communities, there's a very bad image of politicians. Politicians to be egoistic, subjective, uh, they are only interested in power uh, and so on, biased uh, anyway. So let's go for a new system without 
these polit politicians without elections simply give uh, governance and government to an AI algorithm um, programmed on issues we want to have, programmed on common good, on uh, good ethical values, on um, optimization, uh, and so on. And this algorithm then will calculate the common good in an objective manner and then also take the adequate measures to reach common good. Okay, so you see there are many storylines in these digital communities um, which, uh, where a negative image of humans is in the background and the algorithms and the new technologies with AI, they shall overcome the human deficits. And now I come to uh, anthropology and I guess I should come to an end. I don't have any, what's the time? Do you know? I don't have any feeling. Okay, so I could, should come to an end. To, to philosophical anthropology. Um, it had a very good time in the first decades of the past, uh, oh, no, not, uh, the past century, yes, about 100 years ago. Uh, I mentioned some names here. They tried to understand the specificality of human nature in contrast mainly to animals. And they looked for arguments in favor of a human, in German it's Sonderstellung. I could not translate this German word. It denotes a kind of what makes the human specific as a human compared to other species. And in that time it was to find out uh, this human specificality compared uh, to animals. In the second half of the previous century, the interest on philosophic, philosophical anthropo anthropology declined, and then more naturalist pictures emerged, uh, genetic determinism, uh, brain research, and so on, paleoanthropology, and they created more uh, biological and uh, naturalist pictures of humans. But now, we see a renewed interest in philosophical anthropology, and this is not at the occasion of a Sonderstellung of humans compared to animals, but now it's about new relations of humans with technology. So this is a new field, and in German we call it Technik Anthropology. There was an indication of the hype of this, um, of this subdiscipline because colleagues Kevin Legiri and Martina Hester edited a handbook on technic anthropology, which was published, I guess, I guess, one or two years ago only. So it is about changing relations between humans and technology. And now uh, the question of Sonderstellung, it migrates to the human, perhaps uh, an assumed human Sonderstellung with respect to AI and AI-governed robots. So um, hmm, some, some questions. You see many question marks on this slide. Um, on equal footing, yeah? Uh, robots and humans cooperate on equal footing. What does this mean? Same rights, same salary. Um, on equal footing, who is the boss in case of conflict? If you look for an autonomous car, for example, self-driving car, it's not that easy to answer this question. Who should be the boss? Uh, in the f at first glance, humans uh, tend to say, well, we humans, of course. But what is, what's if the human driver is, be, is drunk or tired, or perhaps a terrorist wanting to, use, to misuse the car for an attack on pedestrians? Is it really, should it really be always the human uh, uh, as the boss? Over the, over the computer. Um, now, yeah, the next question is difficult to understand for me. What is the, what is the meaning? Okay, when we compare AI robo robots, AI, and humans, um, we always do this to some criteria of performance. Yeah, and, but I guess as soon as we go for this type of comparison. We always had to, uh, already have invested some presuppositions. And 
I wonder, and this is a question to, to our debate, I wonder if a comparison between, let me say, an AI-governed robot at a workplace and a human worker with respect to performance at this workplace um, requires the presupposition that humans are, like the robot, also a kind of digital machine. Um, it is really a question. I don't have the answer. Um, at least if we look for a kind of Sonderstellung of humans, then we have to look for the question whether we regard humans as digital machines in a certain context due to certain ends and purposes as a kind of model for something. That's always okay. Or if we accept uh, the digital, the humans as digital machine as a kind of model of in the, in the assumption that the model of is identical to the modeled. And in that case, um, our uh, self-perception would change not only to model ourselves sometimes as a digital machine, but to be a digital machine. And that is a difference by category, I guess. Um, can we identify human capabilities which cannot be replaced or improved by AI robots? This is, of course, the uh, good old philosophical question. Um, yeah, there might be some candidates, for example, um, to have this difference between the is and the ought. I guess this is really a good candidate. Um, but perhaps we have to discuss. Hermeneutical understanding uh, of text, but also of situations. Um, is it, uh, let me see, I'll take the example of a self-driving car driven by AI algorithms and having sensors. It always observes the environment and it takes data from the environment by the sensors. Um, is this type of um, receiving data from the environment, is this the same as human understanding of a situation while looking around? Or is it different? And what's, what is the difference, if there is a difference? Is it only by quantity uh, that, for example, we have much more data looking around than a sensor can get with, with specific patterns of recognition? Or is there some qualitative difference in this perception behind? If we talk about uh, human Sonderstellung compared to AI robots, uh, of course, then there must be a presupposition that there is at some place a categorical difference between uh, humans and AI robots. Otherwise, it would be only a question of time if uh, AI robots would become better than we humans are in any respect, not only in, uh, in playing AlphaGo or doing this or doing that, but in any respect. If there would be no categorical difference, um, because we humans develop slowly, but uh, the digital technologies are developed quickly. So if there is a, 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 a strong advance on the technical side and only slow advance at the side of humans, then it would be only, the, only a question of time if, um, if the AI uh, species would pass and would get, in, get better in everything. Everything said here under the presupposition that we are digital machines. If we are not, uh, this uh, comparison does not work. So this is, the, the, I guess, the question, the crucial question behind. Okay, now I guess I already talked about this. Yeah. Um, this model for something or model of, that is important. And also the issue of 
our control over the models we have, or if we simply accept the models we have as reality. Yeah, that is always a problem, but in this case it concerns ourselves, so that makes it much more, uh, much more important, I guess. Um, what can we learn from homo, homo digitalis in anthropological respect? That could be a question at the very end. Um, so each of these um, descriptions of humans, the homo mechanicus, homo, um, homo laborans, um, homo um, faber, et, uh, and so on, all these tell something about ourselves. And in their richness, they form a wonderful cosmos of different models of humans. Um, what does the Homo digitalis add to the already existing cosmos of descriptions of humans? Um, on the issue of possible self-consciousness of AI, how could we recognize, uh, for example, if Pepper shows emotion, I guess most of us would not assume that Pepper is really sad. It shows emotion. Um, what would be the case if there is a, it would be an emerging self-consciousness in some robot? And please imagine a, a robot working in an industry, industry 4.0 plant, and at sometimes this consciousness emerges, and then the robot thinks, well, uh, in my plan, it's written down that I shall work here, but uh, I do not want to do this longer. I want to explore the city, and I want to go shopping. And if that robot would go shopping, or would go to a church, or to the opera, um, what would we do? What would we do? Would we really think, well, hmm, there is a new species with self-consciousness, or would we simply think it doesn't work? And if the latter, then we simply would reboot the robot and destroy the emerged self-consciousness. So it's hard to, 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 to imagine the, the, the discovery of self-consciousness uh, because we have to uh, then to distinguish between a real self-consciousness and a simulated one. Okay, now last point, the role of language, uh, stories of birth and death. Uh, this is from an um, advertisement, ad advertisement uh, paper, born in Japan in 2014. It's nice, isn't it? Born, yeah, born in Japan. Um, so uh, it tells something about Pepper like uh, stories are told about humans. Um, and at the end of life, Boomer was a robot combating landmines. When Boomer died in the battlefield in Iraq, the US soldiers and his team gave him an improvised military funeral. They also gave him two medals of honor. Uh, what does this mean? It's a kind of anthropomorphization, of course, uh, we are used, or many people are used to see, for example, their dog or cat as a kind of, in an anthropomorph manner, and they also bring them to a, to a cemetery and so on. This is a well-established practice, but now it sounds different at these occasions with AI behind. So in our common language, we, we always talk, well, the algorithms can learn. The robots are autonomous. The board computers decide about life and death, for example, in case of ethics dilemmata in self-driving cars. The robots think and cooperate and so on. Always we use phrases um, from the, our human interaction, from our human cooperation, we transfer them to our cooperations with robots, with AI. So, uh, and by doing this, I guess something more happens than just talking about this, but we assign human attributes and capabilities to AI, AI algorithms and AI, AI machines. And in a sense, thereby, we accept that AI robots uh, become kind of new members of society. 
a new kind of relatives. We do this by applying this type of anthropomorphic language. Um, so I guess we need to be careful about uh, what happens if we use this type of language while talking about our current and future um, life together with those technologies. So I could, should come to an end. I will skip this and come to this um, last slide. What does this all mean? Perhaps not much. But perhaps there are some, some interesting questions included. And I would like to learn more about these questions, first of all in order to, for the sake of enlightenment, that we know and, and understand what happens um, about the meaning of the notions used, about the meaning of the transfer of notions from the human domain to the uh, AI domain. Um, it is important to know what happens, otherwise we would run blindly into the future in this respect, and I guess here is much at stake. So we should be careful about this. And this is, so, so uh, to speak, the, yeah, the, the idea of technology assessment, to be careful of, of what we are doing and to try to understand in depth what's going on. And the storyline from philosophical anthropology is, well, it's interesting. It's interesting what happens. Let's look to the ongoing developments. Let's look to the narratives. Let's look how people act and interact at the occasion of AI. And let's try to learn uh, what this homo digitalis story could perhaps add to the many, many uh, pictures and models of humans which are already uh, available, had, have, made, have been made available over the last uh, two or three thousand years. So we are living in an interesting time. Thank you.